grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our sermon is the Gospel reading that we just heard. There are several accounts in the Gospels that if we were honest, we would have preferred had been left out of the record because they shed a, a bad or a hard light on Jesus, or at least we think that they do. When Jesus says that he comes not to bring peace but a sword and to turn family members against one another, we wish Matthew had left that part of Jesus' story out. After all, St. John says that not everything that Jesus did is included in the scriptures. Why then did Matthew have to include that? Or this encounter before us today that happens between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. It confuses and bothers us that Jesus would ignore this poor woman with a request for helping her innocent daughter instead of listening to her and offering to help. But here it is, and this account belongs exactly right here. It is necessary for us to hear this as long as we can set aside all of our uncomfortableness with Jesus' silence, the awkwardness of Jesus' rejection of this poor woman for just a moment, I suspect and I propose that if we can do that, we will see that this may be one of the most important accounts in the Gospels for you and I to come to grips with and to understand. I say that this account belongs right here because it is the perfect counterbalance to the Gospel that we heard just last Sunday from Matthew's 14th chapter. Last Sunday, we heard about Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee to his disciples who were in the sea on a, in a boat. In the midst of this dramatically convincing demonstration of the majesty of our Lord over the forces of nature, Peter asked Jesus for permission to get out of the boat and walk on the water too. What Peter saw, when Peter saw the waves, when Peter saw the wind, he took his eyes off Jesus, his faith began to fail, and he began to sink. And the conclusion of this spectacular adventure with Jesus ends in Jesus' words to Peter, O oh, you of little faith. Now today we meet a woman, a lowly woman, a Canaanite woman, not an Israelite, whose name we are not even given. She has spent no time with Jesus learning from him. She knows him only by the hearsay of others. There is no dramatic demonstration of his power or convincing miracle to eliminate all of her doubts, all of, all of, all of the doubts about his ability to help her at least not until the end of this account. Yet at the conclusion of this account, we hear these words of our Lord, woman, great is your faith. What is it that Matthew wants us to understand about this woman's faith that makes it so great after just hearing about Peter's lack of faith and little faith. And more importantly, what is it that this woman sees in Jesus that causes her to cling to him in spite of his silence and rejection of her? First of all, I'd suggest that we be sure to see that here is a person with whom we can all identify, especially parents, and most especially parents whose children cause them pain. Peter walking on the water is hard for us to identify with. 
this woman is all of us. Her daughter is severely demon-possessed. Her daughter is the one with the problem. But with tears in her eyes, her plea is, Lord, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Every parent knows what's going on here. What parent isn't torn apart when things are not right with the children? Demon possession may be a little medieval for us to relate to, so let's put it this way. My child is in with a bad group of kids and is in trouble at school. My child is doing drugs and I'm watching him ruin his life and he won't let me help. My child challenges me about everything and everything turns into an argument. Label the problem however you want, but every parent knows the pain that this woman is bearing because things are not right with her child. Parent or not, we all know how we can be torn up on the inside when someone else whom we love is suffering. There are two ways to deal with this kind of pain. You can try to cover it up by keeping so busy on the job, with the hobby, anything at all to avoid actually feeling the pain. If that doesn't do it, there's always drugs or alcohol or a hundred different ways to lose yourself in the computer. Or we can acknowledge the pain that we feel and go to our Lord with it. After all, Jesus promises that all who are weary and heavy laden ought to come to him because he promises that they will find rest for their souls. This is certainly the harder of the two options because it means that we must acknowledge that we are hurting and that our lives are not perfect, nor are our children's or our loved ones. To expose the sore spot and be vulnerable is not easy to do because it involves swallowing our pride and that is always painful. But that is just what this woman does. This Canaanite woman drops every pretense of self-respectability and exposes her broken and her hurting heart to this Jewish man and asks him for mercy. She doesn't offer a list of reasons why he should. She relies solely on his mercy as if to say, Sir, aren't I exactly the reason that you came into this world? And it is right here, right here where this, this account brings its tension. And the tension starts to build. We have certain expectations of Jesus. And we expect we expect him to live up to our expectations of him if he wants to be our Lord. We expect him to respond to our prayers and quickly and in certain ways. And when he doesn't, we insist on some kind of reasonable explanation. The disciples walking along the Emmaus Road on Easter evening were asked why they were so downcast and sad. They replied, we expected this Jesus of Nazareth to be the Redeemer of Israel, but he was crucified on the cross and he failed to meet our expectations. You can't really tell from the account whether or not the disciples are actually sad for Jesus or now more than just a little miffed at Jesus for failing to live up to his, the expectations they had of him. Jesus reacts to this woman in the opposite way as we would expect him to react. We expect him to answer this poor woman who has swallowed every last ounce of pride in her coming to him. 
That's what Jesus is supposed to do when we pray to him, isn't it? Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, says the scriptures. But here, here the same holy scriptures record for all the world to hear. He answered her not a word. The disciples were right there, so much like us, lacking even an ounce of compassion for this woman with whom they are annoyed. They say to Jesus, send her away for she's crying out after us. To which our Lord answers, I'm not even going to do that much. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. She is a Canaanite. She's not an Israelite. It's not her turn. She's going to have to wait. This is incredible. It would say preposterous. Where does Jesus get the nerve? But this woman doesn't respond like we do at all, does she? Rather than being incensed and stomping off, she kneels before Jesus. And actually the word here, kneels, doesn't get it. It's the word for prostrate, one, to prostrate oneself. She lays down on her belly, face down to the ground. She casts every last ounce of dignity aside and brings her whole body to the ground level before Jesus and simply says, Lord, help me. Again, she doesn't outline the reasons why he should help her. There's no hint of anger in her voice. She is relying solely on his mercy. And Jesus, Jesus replies to this poor woman by calling her a dog. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dog. And at this point in the account, the account, we, if we were honest, we're, are incensed with Jesus. We're at the very least confused. We don't know where he's gotten this attitude of his or why, but if that's the way he's going to be, and if he's not going to show this poor woman the respect that she deserves, then frankly, frankly, we're going to have to think about just how far we want to go with him. It is really interesting to read the incredible contortions that the Bible commentaries go through to defend Jesus here. Pages are written about dogs and how the word that Jesus uses is really a very nice kind of dog. Something the woman might even be proud to be called. But I like this woman, I like this woman's response to Jesus a whole lot better than the scholar's explanation, or our own for that matter. She doesn't question the reason for his silence. She doesn't dispute his order for who comes first in his kingdom. And she didn't take offense at being called a dog. She responded, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, listen to that response and let it sink in once again. Yes, Lord. No debate, no argument, no explanation, simply yes, Lord, which is to say, you're right about me, Lord. I have absolutely no claim on you whatsoever. You know me better than I know myself. And I will not try to impress you with my worthiness or my merit. I will not say that you are wrong for not answering me, nor will I say that I deserve your attention or that I am better than some of these people that you call your children. And then from her prostrate position before Jesus, she adds this small, this small but powerful word, Yet, 
friends, it is right here, right here, where we see great faith at work in the heart. Yet, despite everything else, yet. Job says, though he slay me, yet I will hope in the Lord. The three young men who were led to the fiery furnace for refusing to worship the false gods of Babylon reply to the king saying, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Yet if not, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This poor woman Though you will not answer me, though you will not respond to me, though you will not call me your child, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She will not abandon her hope in Jesus. Luther's words here are simply too precious to pass up. Classic Luther writes, this woman catches the Lord Christ in his own words. Yes, still more, with the rights of a dog, she gains the right of a child. Now where will he go, the dear Jesus? He has caught himself, and he must help her. But know this well, he loves to be caught this way. If we only had the skill of this woman to catch God in his own judgment and say, Yes, Lord, it is true, I am a sinner, and I am not worthy of your grace, but you have promised forgiveness and did not come to call the righteous but sinners. How do we respond when God does not answer us? We are right to commend this woman for her great faith. We are even more right to commend our Lord who triumphs in this woman by giving her this great faith. He has created this faith in this woman and now through his silence, through his delay, through the challenges that he lays out, he conforms this woman into his own image. Tell me that this woman doesn't look a whole lot like Jesus, who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. In fact, the silence that this woman is hearing is only an echo of the silence that Jesus would hear from the cross where he would cry out to the Father in heaven, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you listening to me? Why aren't you answering my prayer? Nowhere is God's silence more deafening than when Jesus cried out to his Father and he answered not a word. And how does Jesus react to the Father's silence? Argument, rejection, resentment, no. Though you crucify me, though you will not rescue me, yet into your hands I commit my spirit. And with these words, the Son has caught the Father in his own promise to raise him up on the third day. And know this, the Father in heaven loves to be caught like this. By his trust in the promise of the Father, Christ has triumphed over the, on the cross, and that triumph continues to be carried out in everyone who trusts in him. This woman was satisfied with the crumbs that fall from the children's table, 
and then she is invited to eat at the master's table the choicest meats, the finest wine. Christ is triumphed in her. It is by Christ's triumph on the cross that every Canaanite woman, every parent, every man, every woman, every child, no matter the problem, no matter the trouble, no matter the pain, no matter the silence from God, is able to say, yet will he triumph in me. Amen. We stand for prayer.